Yes, today I'm going to talk about um, uh, primarily self-assembly um, in an encapsulated context. Uh, but I want to start by just giving you an overview of uh, what my lab does. Um, as um, it was mentioned, we're particularly interested in uh, uh, getting close to um, mimicking what cells do using nucleic acids. And in particular, we think of cells as uh, smart materials. Um, so here you can see this famous movie of a neutrophil chasing a bacterium. And this neutrophil is essentially a blob, um, an aggregated um, a system of different components that changes shape in order to track the bacterium and then catch it. And the way it does that is by a concerted action of different uh, self-assembling components, but also signals from receptors um, and then uh, signal processing circuits that transmit that information to uh, gene networks that decide what materials to produce and also how to regulate their assembly. And so we think of this at a very abstract level as a smart material that has components for sensing, control, and actuation. And uh, um, what my group does is we use nucleic acids to uh, basically build this general abstraction, uh, taking advantage of all the components that our field has developed. Um, so you probably all know about aptamers. They are nucleic acid sequences that respond to particular inputs by changing uh, conformation. <clears throat> and by that change of conformation, they are able to transmit the information that they have sent something. There's a variety of circuits available. Um, um, for example, here I'm showing you um, a molecular oscillator that was developed many years ago and uh, um, basically responds uh, to uh, uh, the, ex the presence of, of, of the right um, enzymes by generating periodic up and down signals. And then there's a variety of assemblies, right, from few nanometers in size to tens of microns. And those assemblies can actually be um, connected to other biological components, such as uh, proteins, but also to non-biological elements like uh, uh, nanoparticles of different kinds. Um, so the, the, the job of my group is that of taking parts and connecting them. So we're trying to think about how to put all this, these different systems together and make them work under similar conditions. Uh, and in particular, the kind of assemblies we work on, um, I'll talk about it a little bit now, we're interested in getting assemblies to respond to uh, DNA or RNA inputs that are produced by circuits or sensors. And uh, the type of assembly we use are filaments, okay? We focus on uh, filaments because they are uh, versatile components in biology. Um, you know uh, all about probably uh, you've heard of uh, microtubules and actin filaments and uh, that's the movie I was showing at the beginning. That's what cells uh, use for um, motility and for transport and what microtubules and, and actin filaments do. It's basically they recycle uh, monomers uh, by changing their energetic state. Um, and those monomers are used for both nucleating, elongating polymers, um, and then there's uh, uh, proteins that coordinate that assembly uh, into bundles, uh, networks, and branch filaments. And so they basically, you have a few uh, nanometer elements uh, that give you micrometer structures. Um, all their work happens at, room, at physiological temperature. Um, and it's usually all these processes are reversible. So this is the kind of features we want to embed into the filaments we work with. And now what filaments are we considering? Uh, we are, of course, considering DNA filaments. They're generally known as nanotubes, and there's many kinds of nanotubes. The particular kind that we use is um, uh, composed by the double crossover tile. Uh, this tile, um, the type of tile we adopted has five distinct strands. Each strand in the schematic here is highlighted by a different color. Um, and um, as you can see, there's two helices, one on top of the other, and they're held together by two crossovers, where the yellow, blue, and green strand, they cross from the top helix to the bottom helix. Um, and uh, as you can see, there's unpaired domains that are marked here as A, A prime, B, and B prime, and they're known as sticky ends. And if you design the sticky ends correctly uh, in terms of length, then you can get um, the assembly of lattices that fold into tubes. 
And here you can see um, example fluorescence microscopy images of those tubes. These were labeled with a fluorescent molecule. That's why we can see them. Um, and then the key thing is that if you are able to assemble monomers, uh, then they will um, um, self-assemble among them to form filaments. And what I'm going to show you later are a lot of plots where we're basically taking images over time of these filaments as they grow. Um, and then we will plot uh, their mean length uh, versus time. Now, I mentioned that uh, these mon these uh, th there's different types of nanotubes, and this particular type of tile, for example, could be made also using RNA. Um, and uh, just I wanted to uh, point that out. Uh, you need to adapt the um, um, design, the domains of the crossover tile, the double crossover tile, to accommodate for the different helicity of RNA. Uh, but once that is done, uh, you can obtain uh, a very nice nanotubes. And if you're interested, here's a series of uh, recent papers um, from um, our group. But let's go back to the uh, key aspect. Uh, we want to get nanotubes that dynamically self-assemble, uh, like mm, filaments in nature. And so we have developed different methods to uh, take DNA nanotubes, uh, DNA tiles, and uh, through the presence of specific inputs, we can go from a tile that is in an active state to an inactive state. When the tile is active, it forms nanotubes. When it's inactive, the nanotubes disassemble. Um, and then we have also developed methods to add other inputs and take the reaction and revert it. So when an active tile becomes uh, active again and you promote assembly. Uh, now here I am in this schematic, I am uh, showing the inactive tile as a tile that is missing the sticky ends. And uh, although that's not the only way to do it, that's primarily uh, the method we followed. So you try to kind of occlude or eliminate the binding sites uh, that interconnect different tiles to regulate their activity. And as far as inputs, we have explored different things. Uh, we have explored inputs that are oligo oligonucleotides, enzymes, small molecules, and even light. Uh, but the key is we have been able to show you can control assembly of nanotubes uh, and you can achieve assembly of micrometer structures from nanometer elements. These Once the tiles are folded, they assemble between 25 and 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, and, it, and we have also been able to show it's a reversible process under certain conditions. And now it's just an overview of things we've done in the past. Uh, we were able to show uh, um, assembly controlled by pH by in introducing sensors uh, for pH. Uh, we were able to use RNA to direct assembly. Uh, and finally, we were also we also show that you can uh, achieve autonomous dynamic control by connecting uh, the um, assembly process to the oscillator that I briefly mentioned at the beginning. So as the oscillator components uh, change level and go from high to low, that way they, they, um, they control release of molecules that invade the, the nanotubes and cause them to disassemble, and then through an enzyme uh, that degrades DNA um, bound to RNA, uh, sorry, the degrade RNA bound to DNA, you can obtain um, reassembly. So this is just basically an overview uh, of what we are building on. Um, and next, I'm going to tell you specifically about some uh, new results that are at the moment uh, under revision, but hopefully the paper will come out soon. Um, so we, we studied how to obtain dynamic self-assembly of DNA nanotubes in water in oil droplets. And that is uh, because basically any cell, as you have seen from the uh, general schematic at the beginning, you know, cells have membranes, cells operate in a close, you know, it's a closed environment. And so we were interested in, in, uh, in the question whether we could embed these uh, um, assembly processes in, in, a, uh, in a compartment that mimics um, the, 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 sh the, the shape and the, and the general uh, size of cells. Um, so I'm going to tell you about the methods we have developed for encapsulation, uh, how we process the data, and then how we obtain some RNA-directed assembly that was um, dynamic in nature. Um, so first of all, uh, encapsulation. So there's different ways of encapsulating uh, molecules, and we have used um, as a starting point water in oil droplets. Uh, these are far from actually the chemistry of cells because these are monolayer uh, lipid droplets, and they, they it's basically an aqueous phase enclosed into an oil phase, and they're not at the moment capable of communication, and they're actually much more rigid than actual cells. 
but it's a starting point because actually, um, as far as I know, there's very few studies uh, geared toward encapsulation of nanostructures, and we wanted the simplest environment possible that we knew was going to work easily. So there's, uh, as an encapsulation method, one could go by simple vortexing. So as you would make a vinaigrette uh, for your salad, you mix oil and aqueous phase, and you shake the compartment, the, the, the test tube, and you obtain uh, droplets of a variety of, of sizes. Um, another approach is to use microfluidics. In this case, uh, you can use a flow focusing device. It's pretty easy to make it, and that gives you more control over the radii. However, it is also more laborious, and uh, given the time it takes to set up the whole microfluidic contraption, we decided to stick to the vortexing uh, protocol for the rest. For the rest, the rest of the experiment that I'm going to show you today were obtained through uh, vortexing. And if you want more details about what type of water in oil droplets we're using, um, it's basically a work that was published before by um, Holtz et al. Um, in 2008. And uh, later on, we actually, uh, in collaboration with Fritz Simmel, we showed that you can um, um, encapsulate uh, oscillators and other um, chemical reactions into these oil droplets with minimal interactions with the surface. Um, so there's an aqueous phase here that is a, a TAE a magnesium buffer with the DNA tiles. Um, and then by simple vortex, sim we simply vortex the sample, create the droplets, and then we image them. Uh, and here is more about the structure of the surfactant, but again, I'm happy to share more details. Um, all right, so we were able to show assembly um, uh, of nanotubes, nanotubes inside droplets with different methods. The first, simple, the simplest thing to do is to um, anneal, form your nanotubes prior to encapsulation and then vortex. Um, and we obtain, we were able to obtain nice nanotubes, but um, most of the droplets look like they have hairballs inside. And we believe that that's because during the uh, uh, vortexing process, the preformed nanotubes become damaged. Uh, and probably this high error rate of, uh, in the assemblies causes um, misformed uh, uh, tubes and more uh, branching and, and um, you know, uh, undesirable uh, interactions uh, more than we would like. Um, so we uh, developed a separate method, which is we basically first encapsulate each strand uh, all together in the, in the droplets. And then after that, um, we go through a step of annealing. And that is possible because this particular type of droplet is, is resilient to heating. And uh, with that method, um, you can obtain uh, better uh, looking uh, nanotubes with less of that, uh, you know, fuzzy hairball um, aspect. Uh, but you basically, you can, you can achieve, uh, you can see that the nanotubes survive inside the droplets in both cases. Um, then, you know, with the uh, method number two here at the bottom, you can actually show you can anneal and form distinct nanotube populations. So if you have um, two different tiles, they are structurally identical, but they have different sequences, so they don't interact with each other. Um, and uh, you encapsulate and then anneal. What you see is that at the end, at the end you have uh, distinct nanotube populations. And here is an example image of that. Now, here we encountered several challenges that I'm not going to talk about today, uh, but they mainly uh, relate to the type of fluorophore that is used for imaging. Uh, we found that fluorophores can actually cause uh, undesired aggregation and interactions with the surface, uh, probably due to their hydrophobicity. And so not all the pairs of fluorophores that we picked uh, worked well. Um, so now, on top of the methods that I mentioned now, uh, there's a different thing one can do, which is um, use nanotubes that assemble from two separate types of monomers. Um, so, for example, um, you know, monomer A and monomer B. This, this was, by the way, a design that was published a while ago. Uh, and basically, both A and B are needed for the nanotubes to form. This means that one can fold the tiles ahead of time, store them, and then only when they are mixed, and encapsulated, they will start forming um, the nanotubes inside the droplets. So uh, because of this uh, um, you know, separate folding of the nanotubes, one can actually, for, of the tiles, one can observe assembly from the very beginning um, if you're fast enough with the mixing and, encapsul and encapsulation step. And so here's a sequence of images of that, what that would look like. Um, so you have, uh, we have followed uh, the same droplets over several hours. And you can see that at the beginning, uh, the uh, fluorescence inside the droplets is pretty much uniform. 
Um, but as time progresses, uh, you can observe the nanotubes uh, starting to assemble. Um, and then as time moves on, they um, join um, and eventually form uh, what, uh, you know, assemblies that look like bundles uh, or extremely long nanotubes that appear to form a single, uh, uh, basically it looks like a stick, but this is actually a ring. Um, and here is a movie. Um, it's basically a, a GIF image um, of different uh, um, droplets as they are uh, undergoing the maturation, what we call maturation of, of nanotubes inside. Um, so the fact that we observe rings um, may be surprising, but it's actually not too strange. Other um, types of uh, biological filaments have the same behavior. Um, so um, here I'm just showing you uh, a snapshot of the last hours of uh, the movie that I was showing in the previous slide. Um, and I'm and so, so you, can, you can see in some of the droplets that by the way they move, these are really rings. Um, microtubules in droplets and actin in vesicles um, were observed to form rings as well. And there's actually a whole series of uh, modeling papers that show how um, this ring formation is a behavior associated to many types of soft polymers. Um, so um, now, next, we wanted to, of course, explore how uh, the assembly speed um, and the formation of rings, how does it relate uh, to uh, different conditions in the assembly? Uh, so, so, for example, the first thing we did was vary the concentration of monomers, uh, of tiles. And so in the next slide, I'm going to show you, most of the experiments I'll show you are all uh, done using the two-tile system that I just introduced. Um, so uh, this slide is busy, but what you need to pay attention to for now is mostly the, the right side. Here, each row uh, refers to assembly under different concentrations of tiles. So we go from 50 nanomolar to, to 250. Um, and then at the end, the last row is showing you 100 nanomolar using PEG. Um, and uh, so each column corresponds to a different point in time. Um, so you can see that at 50 nanomolar each tile, we have to um, wait for uh, probably half an hour before we see uh, nanotubes that are quite long. Uh, but with the 250 nanomolar, uh, basically within 15 minutes, you can already see pretty long nanotubes. Um, and clearly the, the, there's more bundles and more rings in the 250 nanomolar tile. When we add crowding agent, uh, which is PEG, the nanotubes form immediately. So right after we mix them, uh, the nanotubes are already formed. Um, <clears throat> and this is consistent with, uh, this behavior is consistent with even like a simple model. Um, so we adapted um, an ODE model from Zhang, Hariari, uh, et al., uh, where uh, they, they basically uh, model simply the assembly of tiles and the elongation of nanotubes, uh, so nucleation and elongation. And this gives you three ODEs, and from these ODEs, one can model the fraction of assembled tiles. And obviously, the more tiles we have, uh, the uh, faster uh, the assembly uh, is. And... Uh, um, one more thing that I wanted to mention about uh, concentration is that um, nanotube assembly is visible, is evident as concentrations, at concentrations as little as 25 nanomolar each tile. Um, so here you can compare um, images, microscopy images taken in a non-encapsulated sample, so that's what we call bulk, uh, versus droplets. And uh, at this very low concentration inside droplets, uh, you can, after 24 hours, you can clearly see what look like, uh, in some cases they look like aggregates, but in many cases they're like thick, uh, longer nanotubes. Um, whereas, uh, you know, taking images uh, under fluorescence microscopy in a non-encapsulated sample is, is actually very difficult to find uh, significant uh, assemblies. So now this, uh, we don't have AFM images of this, uh, but it's, uh, the point here is simply that encapsulation might allow you to observe more easily. Um, samples at very low concentration um, um, without having to uh, use um, um, atomic force microscopy and it prevents, it protects your sample from evaporation um, and from, and you can like actually look at the kinetics over time. 
So now, as you can, as you probably imagine, uh, this method gives you a ton of data because you get uh, um, nanotubes in, you know, hundreds and uh, hundreds of droplets each time. And we wanted to have a quick um, uh, method to track assembly in this population of droplets. Now, the problem is, you know, what uh, we, we were faced with the question, well, what do we actually want to track? Because uh, to get a sense of length of the nanotubes or even their number, uh, it would be very challenging. Um, you could do that with time lapse uh, or uh, light, light sheet microscopy, but they turned out to be quite laborious. Um, and in any way, the nanotubes intersect and overlap. So it's hard to tell uh, where a nanotube begins and where a nanotube ends. Is it two? Is it one? Is it three? Um, also when they branch. Um, and furthermore, they actually move quite a bit uh, during imaging. So here is an example confocal microscopy image, and you can see how fuzzy um, the nanotubes appear. So it's actually pretty difficult to uh, count them or to tell how long they are. So we decided to go with a simpler approach um, that allows you to track assembly across multiple droplets based on epifluorescence images, so not confocal. And the way we did it was by tracking uh, statistical, uh, doing statistical analysis of the images. Meaning, um, so here is uh, an example droplet that we picked, and if you plot the histogram um, of pixels, um, uh, pixel intensity, uh, at the beginning it looks like uh, what is shown here. Um, as time progresses and nanotubes form, uh, because there is basically incorporation of fluorescent material in a, in a uh, confined region, uh, very basically there is now uh, uh, most of the pixels become dark and few of them be are very bright. Um, so the histogram uh, changes over time and by 24 hours it looks completely different than what it was at the beginning. So you have a big uh, asymmetry, uh, the peak is moved to the left, but there is also a tail um, that shows you how there's few uh, pixels that are extremely bright. And so to capture this change in the histogram shape, we use the, the third and fourth moment of the histogram. Uh, they're also known as skewness and kurtosis, and skewness uh, <clears throat> gives you a sense of how asymmetric the, the, the histogram is, and kurtosis tells you about how big the tails are. And if you plot um, skewness and kurtosis of uh, droplets like the one shown here, um, you can see that they both go up um, over time as nanotubes, as nanotubes assemble. And one nice thing about this approach is that it is, um, as long as you're working in the linear regime of your instrument, uh, of the detector, of the, of the, uh, of the microscope, they are uh, insensitive to bleaching and exposure. So uh, if you have uh, systematic bleaching of all pixels, your histogram will essentially move, shift to the left, but the shape um, should remain the same. The relative intensity should remain the same, so skewness and kurtosis um, don't um, are not affected. And so if I show you again um, images um, that, um, that uh, I mentioned earlier, the 100 nanomolar tile um, examples, and then the um, uh, 100 nanomolar versus PEG, um, here to the right you can see the skewness and kurtosis plots, um, and you can see how, for example, so they both go up over time, both measures. Um, and one important thing is that they are able to capture um, the um, uh, different initial conditions. So here, um, with the, when we start imaging, the PEG droplets um, have already very high, uh, higher skewness and kurtosis relative to the sample without PEG. Um, and an important observation is that this comparison makes sense and it works uh, because we have the same concentration of tiles. Uh, now we have to be careful to use this approach when we compare droplets that have different tile amounts because that affects the background, that affects uh, how much fluorescence we have. Um, and so here you can, if you compare, for example, 50 nanomolar tile samples with 250, now the model and then the data showed us that uh, here you have assembly sooner, but actually skewness and kurtosis don't reflect that. And they're basically indistinguishable. And if anything, the 250 nanomolar sample looks to have lower skew skewness and kurtosis, but that's because the bottom sample has a higher background. And so the, the shape of the, of the histogram would be affected by, by changing background. 
Um, I want to mention finally that, uh, so I'm going to show you a bunch of skewness and kurtosis plot. This is a, again, a qualitative approach, but it allows you to compare uh, the extent of condensation of assembly across a population of droplets. And it's useful if you are comparing apples and apples, if you have the same background level in the droplets. Now, an alternative approach um, that uh, one could follow is to actually um, look at epifluorescence microscopy images and try to segment uh, the nanotubes that we observe. And, and like with these uh, segments, one could, for example, ask, well, uh, what is the contour length? Uh, you know, how many segments do we observe? And what is the average length of each segment? We could probably get uh, plots that look similar to the skewness and kurtosis, but the problem is that this is, uh, we found it's difficult to automate. Uh, so for now, we are not able, uh, well, while we have an automated workflow for skewness and kurtosis, this is harder to automate because of the, uh, basically, uh, there, there's a lot of like eye of the of the of the experimenter in order to capture which ones are actually segments and which ones are not. Uh, so, for example, we, we expect that some machine learning algorithm could help here, but we don't we haven't uh, produced any yet. So uh, I'm going to like I'm almost done. I just want to present the last set of experiments. Um, so now with the uh, protocols we have. Uh, for encapsulation and the um, methods for processing the droplet images, we um, went on to encapsulate RNA activatable tiles um, so that then you can take advantage of RNA production and degradation uh, as they kinetically happen inside the, uh, the droplet. And so here we have uh, now, it's a slightly different type of tile, and it looks, I'm going to show you in the next slide uh, what it looks like here. The gray strands are DNA, and the green strand is RNA, so it's a hybrid DNA-RNA tile. Um, and, uh, you know, in control experiments, you can simply encapsulate the folded gray part and then add the green part. Um, and this is um, what we did. And what we obtain is that if we have the right amount of trigger, we can see nanotubes forming quite quickly. And here would be skewness and kurtosis across the population. Um, however, one thing we observe is that if you add too much RNA, what happens is we have aggregates instead of uh, um, well-formed nanotubes. And we think that because RNA is generally very sticky, uh, it promotes aggregation and more variability. Now, it's, it's important to note here that the skewness and kurtosis method doesn't tell you the difference, uh, meaning that um, it will still tell you, yes, you do have condensation, you do have assembly, but you can't tell uh, by just looking at the graph whether they are actually nanotubes or aggregates. So the key thing is you need to have the right amount of RNA. If you have too much, your nanotubes are not forming um, properly. Um, so with that in mind, um, now you can proceed to have uh, we went on and, and tried to do uh, transcription and degradation inside the droplets with the um, uh, <clears throat> with this, together with the, with the self assembly. And so, um, in so first, of course, you need to try it in a non encapsulated context. And there's many parameters you can vary because now you have a synthetic gene that is producing RNA in the presence of polymerase. And for example, one thing you can do is change this genetic template that is producing RNA. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, the more template you have, uh, the more nanotubes you will observe. So these are uh, data from non-encapsulated experiments showing you mean length versus time. Um, so uh, now you can do the same thing inside uh, droplets. And uh, what we observed at a given tile, uh, inactive tile amount uh, and a given amount of template plus uh, PEG. Uh, we needed PEG to actually uh, promote. Um, uh, we were not sure yet whether PEG helped with the transcription speed or simply by pushing the nanotubes to the surface and making it easier to observe them. Uh, however, we found that PEG is, is necessary to, um, to get this reaction to work in droplets. And so here are example images. Um, and now if you vary the amount of template, you get assembly uh, happening um, with a different speed. So if you have a low amount of, of template, um, they, um, basically you need about three hours to get to steady state. Uh, but if you have a higher amount of gene, um, you need uh, about an hour to get close to steady state. Um, and uh, um, at some point when you use too much gene, um, you get assembly that happens 
immediately. However, these images, I'll tell you, they had quite a bit of aggregation. Um, so these results are consistent with what you would get, uh, what you would predict with an unfitted model uh, that again takes, uh, is adapted from the Zhang um, and Hariari model that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, but includes also the um, uh, reactions for transcription um, and degradation. Now, and like the last thing I want to talk about is, uh, so here actually um, we did not have degradation, we only had production of RNA. If you do add degradation, um, in non-encapsulated experiments, what you observe is that you get a transient production of nanotubes. Um, and that's because um, uh, initially the polymerase that makes RNA has a burst of activity. So it kind of uh, um, uh, takes over the reaction. You have a buildup of RNA forming. And then as time progresses, uh, RNA polymerase loses activity, but RNA's H uh, appears to be a more stable enzyme. And so degradation takes over as uh, at longer, uh, at longer times. And so what you can see is a pulse of assembly that uh, can be tuned in terms of both uh, maximum length and uh, duration uh, by tuning the amount of RNA's H. And so we repeated these experiments in uh, inside droplets and we indeed observed a pulse in assembly. So here are data uh, at a particular, in particular uh, conditions of uh, RNA, RNA polymerase, RNA's H and template. And then lastly, we tried to uh, also vary RNA's H as a way to tune this pulse. And uh, um, here you can see how the more RNA's H you use, the lower the peak of the pulse and also the faster. Uh, so basically uh, here I'm showing you skewness and kurtosis that were um, measured over a population of droplets. And when you have very low amounts of RNA's H, you get a nice peak um, whenever, as opposed to uh, at higher amounts of RNA's H, the peak is almost not detectable. And uh, the model that we have that was again not fitted, uh, we used parameters that were predicted in previous work um, and estimated the amounts of active enzymes uh, with also estimating the decay speed um, of RNA polymerase and we could kind of uh, reproduce uh, the same uh, qualitative features of the peak observed in experiments. Although keep in mind that these are not the same quantities um, uh, because this is showing you a fraction of assembled tiles versus, uh, again, statistical properties of the images. So we're not comparing exactly the same thing, but qualitatively the peak happens more or less at the same time. So that's it. That's it. Um, so to conclude, I just want to get a little bit, bit of perspective of what's next with this. Um, well, because DNA nanotechnology offers a lot of uh, different types of structures and uh, we are getting to the point where we can dynamically control them, we would like to do that inside compartments and get a hierarchical assembly of scaffolds that include both nanotubes but also um, aggregating centers. Uh, so this is work in collaboration with Rebecca Schulman. Um, she has developed many types of DNA origami that have different uh, shapes from which you can grow nanotubes. Uh, for example, L-shaped, T-shaped, and Y-shaped. And so we're hoping to uh, uh, be able to uh, assemble these, these architectures together and see if we can actually obtain any kind of uh, control of positioning of the uh, um, um, nucleation centers uh, using the nanotubes as they grow out of the structure. Um, and uh, another interesting direction we are pursuing is that of including communication between droplets. So we're exploring different things. This is work in collaboration with Fritz Simmel. Um, if we achieve that, we might be able to develop some sort of synthetic uh, consortium of cells that produce uh, tissue-like, uh, you know, uh, scaffolds. Um, and uh, and we could have sort of developmental developmental pro programs across multiple cells, exploiting uh, genetic programs, DNA uh, strand displacement, and assembling structures. So with that, I will conclude. Uh, so as a summary, I hope I gave you a high-level sense of what my group does. Um, we're trying to um, build materials that include sensor circuits and assemblies using nucleic acids. And today specifically, I talked about um, uh, dynamic DNA materials, nanotubes um, in synthetic compartments, protocols, uh, so methods to encapsulate them, uh, to observe them, and then to obtain dynamic behaviors. Um, so with that, I thank uh, my group and uh, uh, funding agencies, 
and I will take any questions if there is time.